Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, this has been joint work with uh, Yu Tian Chen, which is going to give another talk later today, and uh, Zubin. Uh, I'm Yarin. So, first of all, distribution estimation. In distribution estimation, we try to estimate uh, the distribution that generated some data set. In the simple example of categorical data, where the data set is just uh, takes values from finite sets, for example, 1 to k, this is quite easy. You can just look at the relative frequencies of the different values. For example, just use the multinomial model. Uh, what do we do if we have vectors of these categorical values? This turns out to be a bit more difficult. Um, so first of all, where do we come across these vectors of categorical values? We have these in data analysis. Uh, for example, a person uh, answering a series of questions in a survey or medical diagnosis. These often generate sequences of categorical values as well. Um, with the distribution at hand, uh, for medical analysis, for example, for breast cancer diagnosis, we can save a patient from going through unnecessary examinations uh, by looking at which examinations, which tests are needed and which tests can be deduced from others. Um, so looking at breast cancer as an example, why is that a difficult task? Well, uh, do, we have, do I have a point over here? Bah. No, okay, never mind. Uh, why is that a difficult task? Well, first of all, the number of, possible, the number of possible vectors that we have goes exponentially with the number of values, the number of variables that a vector can take. For example, in the breast cancer uh, data set, we have, uh, ten pos we have nine categorical val variables taking ten possible values. That gives us ten to the nine possible, uh, possible uh, configurations. But when you have 600 patients, and in these data sets, in survey analysis, in breast cancer diagnosis, we often have small data, which makes it very difficult. Even, even more annoying, uh, the diversity of the data that we have is often poor compared to the exponentially many uh, vectors that we have in the data set. Uh, existing models using discrete representations look at, uh, the, again, frequencies exactly like what you had in the, multi in the single categorical case. Uh, which doesn't work quite well because of these sparsity issues. Uh, even looking at bigram models, taking pairs of variables, even that fails very, very fast. Uh, we took a different approach. We're using later recent developments in sampling-based virtual inference to develop a continuous, continuous pace model. We define our model as follows. Intuitively, we take uh, so, following the, our breast cancer example from before, we take each patient and embed the patient in a continuous space. So that basically means that we have some distribution over the embeddings for the, for the patients. <laughs> we also have a distribution of the functions that map from these patients to the, to the categorical test results that we can have for each one. So we have D functions for D categorical test results, each one giving us a sequence of K weights. Now, we use softmax to take, uh, for each, uh, to take these sequences of weights and discretize them into medical assessment as we get at the end. So again, we have um, patients distributed according to normal 0, 1. We have some distribution of the functions that map these uh, latent patients embeddings into sequences of weights which are discretized to get a medical assessment. Uh, we use a sparse Gaussian process, uh, like what Matt explained, I'm going to use, instead of a normal Gaussian process, I'm going to use an approximation to the model. Uh, that basically works as follows. Uh, the a sparse Gaussian process is a distribution of functions where instead of, uh, where we use a small number of points, inducing points, over here, these are in red, uh, to support the distribution. Um, what do we have over here? We have, in dark blue, we have the data set. For example, the x-axis would be the patients, the y-axis would be a weight. Uh, the dark blue points would be the x-weight pairs, and the, uh, the red points would be the inducing points that we use to define our function. 
we take these, uh, we, we use z to denote the x values of the red points, and u to denote the y values of these red points, of these inducing points. We define kmm to be the kernel evaluated at point z, which basically captures how similar the points z are to each other, and define kmn uh, to capture uh, other kernel between patient and each one of these supporting points. Basically, how similar is that patient to each one of the supporting points that we have? Sparse Gaussian process uh, uh, is just defined for the conditional Gaussian distribution by weighting the use, the values that these weights take, that these inducing points take, the y-axis, according to how similar patient is to each one of the inducing, to, to the z's, to the locations of the inducing points. And the variance for that is just how far away it is from each one of these points. This gives us the following formal model. X distributes according to normal 0, 1 patient. We have a distribution GP pi over the inducing points. Conditional distribution to generate the weights for our uh, softmax. We collect these weights to get a single distribution. Uh, we collect these, pay, uh, these weights to get uh, for the softmax a single categorical value for our examination. And from that, we get a medical assessment. We want to perform, uh, we want to find the posterior of X and U for this model. Well, this, uh, this turns out to be quite difficult because the softmax likelihood is not conjugate to our GP pi. Uh, so instead of <coughs> So what we ended up doing, what we ended up doing was using, uh, we used variational, variational inference. We um, approximate the, approx we approximate the posterior, uh, P of F, uh, P of X, F and U given Y, using Q. Q is defined as just put a small Gaussian bump over each one of our patients, our patient embeddings. And we model U as a joint Gaussian distribution. We can reparameterize the model to use uh, standard normal distributions. This is basically equivalent to X equals the sum of mean plus standard deviation times noise. Same for U and the same for F. But doing this allows us to write the expectation in our low bound from the version inference that we are using with respect to uh, parameterless distributions. Just epsilon distributes according to normal zero one for all of these. We then use Monte Carlo uh, integra integration to approximate the expectation that we had over here, which is intractable. We have an expectation of log softmax um, for the Gaussian process. Uh, we approximate that using Monte Carlo integration, where the noise is just a uh, noise is independent of the parameters, which means that we can take derivatives very easily and we get very, very small variance for this, uh, for this estimate. Uh, we, take, we use adaptive learning, adaptive learning rate stochastic optimization to optimize the noisy gradients that we have over here uh, to find the par uh, optimal parameters for our variational distribution, M, S, mu, and L. We then use symbolic differentiation to give us simple modular code. This piece of code, less than 20 lines, is enough to run the entire model and inference and um, uh, for, a single, for a single categorical value, and is extremely easy to adapt and change. We assessed our models, um, sorry. Uh, our model uh, relates to some existing, several existing models in the field uh, quite nicely, actually. You can look at linear regression. Starting from linear regression, we can look at the nonlinear equivalent of that. We get Gaussian process regression. Or we can look at uh, the discrete equivalent of linear regression. We get logistic regression. Uh, Nonlinear and discrete uh, equivalents of linear regression give us Gaussian process classification at the back. Moving to the forward of the cube, we get latent input models. Linear regression becomes factor analysis. Gaussian process, classifi Gaussian process regression becomes the Gaussian process latent variable model. Logistic regression becomes a model called latent Gaussian model, and Gaussian process classification becomes the model that we're proposing, uh, which we name the categorical latent Gaussian process. Uh, the latent Gaussian model is actually quite interesting. That's a linear model that uh, 
it basically it works as follows. You put a standard normal distribution of a latent space, you transform that linearly, and then you discretize the outputs. But sadly, that means that you can't capture multimodal distributions, for example. And also, the, uh, the model is a bit cumbersome because it uses a piecewise approximation to a likelihood which approximates a softmax likelihood in the, in the model itself. We assessed our model comparing it to, a, comparing it, uh, to the others uh, uh, on a sequence of uh, unsupervised tasks uh, involving multivariate categorical data. So first of all, comparing the nonlinear model to the linear model. Over here, we just have a simple example using the XOR relation. We just do relation embedding. Uh, we are given sequences uh, uh, from the relation, like 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And the model is to embed that relation in, in our latent space. Over here, the two-dimensional latent space. The two-dimensional latent space over here, we see the same latent space again and again and again and again and again and again. Uh, where each panel, left to right, shows the probability for each point to discretize to a different digit in our relation. The left panel is for the next first digit, second digit, and third digit. So the bottom model, you can see that the top left corner uh, captures uh, the digits 1, 1, 0. And the bottom right captures 0, 0, 0, for example. Whereas the linear model can't really capture that multimodal distribution. We next looked for data visualization. We took the binarized uh, alpha digit data set, and we again used a 2D latent space to try to visualize the data. The alpha digit data set is composed of a very small number of pictures. We have 30 pictures for each digit. Each digit is a, uh, so we have digits and numbers, 36 in total, and each one as only 30 examples. We have, uh, these are composed of binary values. We have 80 binary values that we try to embed in our 2D latent space. Uh, we have the linear model again to the left and the nonlinear model to the right. You can see that we get very, fairly nice separation even though we have 36 classes and we, we're not given the labels for these, uh, for these classes. And you still get very nice uh, separation for the different classes. Next, we looked at data imputation. Uh, go going back to our earlier example, uh, looking at whether we can, uh, look at basically looking at whether we can tell missing values from uh, a partially observed vector. For breast cancer data set, that would be used, for example, to tell whether examination is needed or whether we can say quite, quite uh, certainly that, oh, we, al we already know what that answer is gonna be. <coughs> We scraped the Start Terrorism Data Archive for the terror warning uh, effects on political attitudes data set. Uh, that, basically con that data set consists of 17 categorical variables with five to six values, each one. And we use the Wisconsin Breast Cancer data set from before, nine categorical variables with 10 values each one. And we compared several models, just uniform baseline distribution, uh, predicting uh, just baseline model, uh, uh, predicting uniform values for all, all, the, all missing values. A uh, multinomial model, looking at the frequencies. Again, the linear model and the nonlinear model. And as you can see, we can, as you can see, we actually get some pretty good results for using the nonlinear model compared to the linear and the discrete model. Again, the discrete model, that would not, we have some more results in the paper where we use a bigram model. Uh, over here we just use frequencies of single variables. Even using bigram models without smoothing, you get, you get a very bad results um, because uh, some, configurations, uh, some configurations just don't appear in the data set. Uh, and using smoothing, you get still fairly bad results. Uh, by the way, sorry, I forgot to mention, over here we're looking at test perplexity. That's basically a measure of how much the model is confused about the prediction that it has to make. So, for example, if you have 10 possible values, and uh, if you have 10 possible values and you predict only one of them at random, then you would have test perplexity of 10. Basically saying that, oh, I'm, it's, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. It's going to be any one of these 10 values. 
Um, lastly, we looked at inference robustness. Uh, we looked at the lower bound uh, as, we optimize the, as, op as we optimize the model and of the standard deviation that we get from the Monte Carlo estimate that we used to estimate the lower bound. And as you can see, the uh, lower bound, uh, the standard deviation decreases as we, as we, in, as we optimize the model, uh, which is quite interesting actually, uh, suggesting that the model is quite robust uh, when, you when you sample uh, from the model, uh, you, from, when you sample from the generative model, you get fairly small noise for the estimate. So future directions. Why not scale up the model? There's no real reason why this model should, should be restricted to only small data. We recently showed uh, a joint paper, me, Mark, Fanto Wilk, and Carl Asmussen, that we can scale sparse Gaussian processes rather easily to data sets consisting of millions of data points. And they work quite well. They, work, they do work better than um, than most naive approaches, even random forests and stuff like that. And there's a paper from Sheffield as well showing that we can use mini-batch optimization for Gaussian processes. These models do scale well. We do have an issue with the number of, with the latents that we need to optimize because if we do use large amounts of data, that means that we have um, lots and lots and lots of latent points to optimize over. For that, we can use a recognition model um, this has been used a lot in the deep learning community. Uh, usually you would use a neural net as a recognition model. But why not use a Gaussian process as a recognition model as well as a generative model? This model has a, I mean, using Gaussian process, you have the advantage that you can marginalize over some of your inputs. You can have partially observed data. For example, you can have only 20% of, of your data observed. And you can still find, uh, the, you can still find the posterior for these data points. Um, and lastly, we can very easily use mixed data by just using replacing the link function, which currently is a softmax, by any, of the, for example, any other one to get positives, ordinals, continuous variables, and all of these using exactly the same inference that we have uh, that we have now, changing li one line of code. Uh, so we're currently running experiments with all of these, uh, basically comprising all of these for mixed data recognition model at scale and we hope to release these soon. Um, we have uh, the stuff that I showed you earlier. We have a repository in GitHub that I'm going to upload code to that over the next couple of days, and you're welcome to use that and play with the code. I mean, it's a very, very simple piece of code, just 20 lines for the basic, part, for the basic model. Uh, more efficient implementation, doing caching for the matrices, that's a bit longer, but it's still an ex extremely simple model to use, which is very powerful. Thank you.